So dear students, I welcome you to my class. And I wish you a good afternoon. First of all, I like to make you acquainted with the lecture highlights. Critical analysis of things fall apart. Then Chinua Achebe's worldview. Achebe's treatment of colonialism. Then Chinua Achebe's attitude to Christianity. Orator or oral literature in things fall apart. Then he's studying things fall apart eco-critically. And last of all, I will reflect on the whole lecture on things fall apart. In the last class, we learned about different characters, their roles in this novel. And you know that this novel is a milestone in modern African literature. Because of Chinua Achebe's attempt of liberating African literature and culture from the domination of colonialism or from the stereotyping of colonial enterprises. So how is it possible for Chinua Achebe to liberate Africa, African culture and African literature from the stereotype produced by the European colonizers. It is possible because of his world view. Achebe uh, grew up in an atmosphere which provided him with a disposition of the feeling on disposition of the emotion or impulse of a citizen of the world. He does not confine himself to Africa. He is a man from Africa. And at the same time, he belongs to the whole world. So living in Africa, writing about Africa, he embraces the whole universe. This is the reason for which he has become a celebrated writer, a father figure of African, especially modern African literature. In Things Fall Apart, Chinua Achebe strives to create a world that is wholly different from ours, yet familiar in its portrayal of our shared experience as part of the human race. Achebe's story is of a tribal community's march to modernity, as it is transformed almost overnight into a colonial vessel subjected to European customs and institutions and alienated from its traditional ways. So some important points are marked here. So Chinua Achebe has portrayed a familiar African society. And this African society represents the contemporary Africa. And at the same time, it takes the readers to the essence of Africanism. And it also invites the readers to see that Africa is a broad canvas on which the whole universe can be portrayed. So when we meet his characters and when we analyze the situations and realities that Chinua Achebe has incorporated into things fall apart, we develop, like Chinua Achebe, a worldview. This is not the view of Africa only. This is not a narrow or parochial view. 
it is a view which embraces the whole world. And here lies the greatness of Africa. And Chinua Achebe has uh, made his readers acquainted with the greatness of Africa. So the heart of Africa is not black. The heart of Africa the heart of Africa is uh, the heart of the whole world. The heart of Africa is great, noble. It has the capability to embrace the whole world. And while doing that, Chinua Achebe has unmasked the colonial politics. The European politicians, European exploiters, and European colonizers went on with the propaganda that Africa did not have any culture. Africa did not have any custom, tradition, or even language. So Africa did not have any voice. That was a very deliberate propaganda of the European colonizers. But Genoa Achebe has discovered that Africa has got everything. But all the wealth of Africa, all the resources of Africa, all the brilliant aspects of Africa have been enveloped by the darkness imposed by the European colonizers upon Africa. Now, what is this darkness? Or this darkness is synonymous with ignorance ignorance of the whole world that is the whole world is kept in ignorance about africa by the european discourse about africa so why because while the whole world is ignorant about africa then the european could very successfully and deliberately exploit africa so Genoa achebe has just unmasked this colonial politics and brought the brilliant aspects of Africa to the sight, to the observations, to the knowledge of the rest of the world. Genoa Achebe grew up in the atmosphere that I have already told you, which made him a citizen of the whole world. So how? His parents were Christians, but his other relatives were pagans. Chinua Achebe visited the church and at the same time the pagan temples. So he could accommodate both these belief systems. And this very capacity of his mind helped him develop the world. That is, Africa is great enough to embrace the whole world. Africa has the capability to share its knowledge with the whole world. It has the capacity to bring about a synthesis between Africa and the rest of the world. So Africa is never parochial or Africa is never handicapped regarding its ability or capability. Achebe wrote this novel in 1958. And you know that Nigeria won freedom in 1960. So this novel was produced during the colonial period. For that reason, in this novel, you will find how his protagonist, Okonko, is fighting against the colonial advent or colonial enterprises. And Chinua Achebe made a clear statement about the positive legacies of colonialism. But one thing that we must not forget that Chinua Achebe is not a blind critic of colonialism because he believed that he was a citizen of the whole world. And during the era of globalization, 
it is not possible to remain isolated from the world. If you want to lead your life, or if you want to develop your cosmopolitan view, you must let yourself spread among the other people. So you have to develop a worldview which will embrace the whole world. And for that reason, he was not a blind critic of colonialism. He was a critic of dark aspects of colonialism. And at the same time, he appreciated the positive aspects of colonialism. For example, colonialism brought some institutions to Africa, suppose hospital, then schools, then the other institutions, for example, uh, different sectors of development were introduced by the colonial government. Those institutions were highly appreciated by Chinua Achebe. At the same time, he's a critic of colonialism. So how, how he has criticized the colonial uh, institutions? While these institutions tried to annihilate the local institutions, while these institutions went on with a deliberate politics some uh, annihilating the local heritage, customs, orator, and uh, culture of the natives, then he has criticized that very venture, deliberate venture of colonial, uh, colonial rulers. So we find a kind of harmonious or balanced study of colonial enterprise in things fall apart. I just like to interpret this point from the perspective of the protagonist, Okonko, of things fall apart. Okonko tried his best to keep his own culture intact. He did never want that the colonizers should become active in Umofia, that is the village in which he was living, or in Mubanta, the village in which he spent seven years of his exile. He did never want that the missionary should be active there because the missionary was trying to convert the people into Christians. Even his own son, Noe, was also a converted Christian. So he was very much angry with Christian missionaries. But he was guided by his rock more than by his intellect. And that very particular weakness of Okunko's character brought about the things fall apart like situation in, in, in Africa or in his society, in African society. Chinua Achebe has very analytically depicted the weakness of Okonko. Okonko wants to uphold his own culture. Okonko does not want that his culture should be annihilated by the Western culture. All right. His sincerity, his patriotism is highly appreciable. But while exercising this sincerity, this patriotism, he has violated his own culture or cultural values. So he wanted to become a preserver, a protector of his own culture. But while playing the role of a protector of his own culture, he has taken up the role of a violator of his own culture, willingly or unwillingly. Now how? Suppose the Igbos usually celebrate the week of peace. The week of peace, this is the week, and that very week is usually celebrated 
just immediately before the uh, sowing season, sowing season, that is the sowing of the seed of yam. They observe the week of peace. And during this week, they do not create any kind of violence. They do not beat anybody. They do not even scold anybody. So why? Because they believe that if they can maintain peace and harmony during this week, that is the week immediately before the sowing uh, of the yam seeds, they believe that uh, this very observation will please their gods and goddesses. And if the gods and goddesses are pleased, or even the art goddess Annie, the name of art goddess of the Igbos is Annie. So Annie will be pleased. And if Annie is pleased, and if the other gods and goddesses are pleased, they will have bumper production of yam. This is their belief, cultural belief. So all the Igbos maintain the week of peace. But very unfortunately, one day, Okonto, who was waiting for lunch, and his uh, youngest wife was to serve the lunch to him. That is, Egwefi was to serve the lunch. But unfortunately, Egwefi went to a neighboring house for uh, dressing her hair. So she was late in preparing the lunch for Okonko. So Okonko, who was popularly known as wildfire, the flame of wildfire, he started waiting for the return of his wife, Egwefi. As soon as the wife came back, Okonko started beating her. Not only that, he also brought out his gun and shot at the woman. But unfortunately, fortunately, the woman escaped the bullet. This is the violation of the week of peace. And for that reason, Okonko had to offer some offerings as compensation to the altar of the art goddess. So just think of his behavior. The man who wanted to protect his culture is now violating his own culture, cultural norms and tradition. This dichotomy in the character of Okonko is responsible for the things fall apart like situation. Another important incident that I like to uh, tell you, share with you, that Chinua Achebe has very neutrally brought to the canvas of this text. So what's that incident? The eldest man of the village, Ijuedu, died. And Okunko and many other people went to the household of that very dead man. So everybody were, was producing a noise because producing noise during a funeral ceremony was a part of African culture, Igbo culture. So many people were, some people were beating drums and some other were uh, producing sounds, peculiar sounds. And Okonko was shooting bullets from his gun to produce sounds or noises. Unfortunately, one of the bullets from his gun shot a 16 years old boy. And the boy died immediately. That very boy was the son of the dead man. In Igbo culture, spilling blood of a kinsman was a great sin, unpardonable sin, because all the gods and goddesses go against that man. That is the man who spills the blood of his kinsman. And the only punishment is his self-exile. So Okonko committed this crime. While celebrating the ritual of the culture, 
he violated the celebration. He violated the ritual of the touch. So just think of the dichotomy. He looked upon himself to be a protector of his culture. But every time he was violating his own culture. For this violation, he had to flee from his house along with the other members of the family to the neighboring village Mubanda, the village of his mother. And there his maternal uncle Uchendu was living and Uchendu provided him with shelter, a piece of land, a piece of plot also to build his house. And Okonko was also given some yam seeds so that he could start cultivation. So Okonko, who was a hero, who was a leader, one of the leaders of Umofia, became a zero in Mubanda. So he did not have anything in Mubanda, who had everything in Umofia. So why did it happen? Why did this happen? This happened because of his uh, headstrong attitude, because of his inconsiderate act. The man who wanted to play the role of the protector of his own culture violated his own culture every time while he was very much prone to, to protect his own culture. So just think of the dichotomy in the character of uh, Okunto. And that was the reason for things fall apart my situation. Now, think of Chinua Achebe's uh, competence as, a, as an author. And you, you can also find the relevance of his worldview here. Okonko is very critical. Oh, Chinua Achebe is very critical regarding the activities of the natives. He is not a blind patriot. He is not a chauvinist. He is a critic. And at the same time, he is uh, an enthusiast of the culture, cultural values, norms of Africa. Chinua Achebe has focused light on the brilliant aspects of Africa. And at the same time, he has also thrown sufficient light on the dark aspects of Africa. He has thrown light on the strength of Africa. At the same time, he has thrown light on the weakness of Africa. And this balanced attitude towards African society is lying in the nucleus of the worldview of Chinua Achebe. Okay. Now, what is Chinua Achebe's attitude towards Christianity? If you go through this text, things fall apart. You will find that the Christians came to Umofia. At first, their only objective or the superficial objective that they exposed was to uh, convert the people, convert the natives into Christians, was to provide the people with health facilities, education facilities or academic facilities. But very soon, they tried to, uh, they, they started trades and commerce, that is mercantile activities. And you know that after seven years of exile, while Okonko went back to his village after seven years, he spent seven years of his exile in Mubanda, the neighboring village. It was his punishment, punishment for killing the kinsman. So after seven years, while Okonko went back to his village, he found that the coconuts, palm oil, palm seeds, these products or these things have become very valuable in the village. But before seven years, that is before his exile, these products were not as much costly, as much expensive as they are now. Okonko discovers that 
these things produced by the villagers are now very expensive. So why? Actually, this is an indication of the mercantile enterprise of colonialism. So colonialism was not a stabilizing mission at all. Remember this, though the colonizers went on with the propaganda that it was a civilizing mission, actually it was nothing but their hypocrisy. Colonialism was a profit-making mission. It was a capitalist mission. The objective of, this, of that mission was to maximize the profit of the colonizers. Because the colonizers were especially marchers. If you think of the East India Company in this subcontinent, East India Company was a mercantile company. 100 marchers took permission from Queen Elizabeth in 1601. And they started their uh, commercial activity that is business with 50,000 pounds. They started their business. And at first they started their business in Mediterranean Sea, in different islands of the Mediterranean Sea. Ultimately, they came to this subcontinent. They started trades and commerce here. And ultimately, what did they do? They started taking a hand into the political affairs of this subcontinent. And they involved themselves in political activities. And ultimately, they became the rulers of this subcontinent. And we, who are the owners of this uh, country, became the objects here. So now, I like to tell you that Christianity was only Christianity was only just a, a mask, and just behind this mask, or just below this mask, they had a profit-making intention. Their only intention was to make profit or maximize their capital. Okay. And that very particular incident or historical reality is marked, is mentioned through Okunko's uh, discovery that these materials, that is palm wine or palm seeds, yam, coconut, these things have become very valuable in Umofia. But seven years ago, these things were not as much costly, as much valuable as they are now. Only after seven years, Okunko discovers this dramatic change, a jump of the prices of these things. So in this way, if you read this text very critically, you will find that this text is very potentially and uh, very intensely analyzing the behavior of colonial practice or colonial enterprise in African society. Christianity was just only a mask. And Desmond Tutu, an archbishop, once said that, the Europeans came to our country with the Bible. They had only the Bible and we had our land. So they came to Africa. They asked us to shut our eyes. So we shut our eyes because we believed them. we shut our eyes. And while we opened our eyes, we discovered that the Bible is at our hand, at our hands, and our land is at their hands. 
that is in a change of Bible, they took away our land. So this very statement of Desmond Tutu helps us understand the role of the Bible, the role of the Christianity. Christianity was not a spiritual apparatus. Christianity was never synonymous with spirituality or spiritual practice to the colonizers. They just used this Christianity as an apparatus, as a tool to beguile the people, to befool the people, to uproot the people from their uh, land, from their culture and impose the yoke of slavery or yoke of colonialism upon them. Actually, this is the characteristic or character of Christianity. Now, orator, orator means oral literature. African literature, if you think of original African literature, originally African literature is called orator, that is oral literature. It used to travel from one person to another, not on the paper, not on the pages of the books, but through the lips, that is from one person to another person. African literature used to travel from one community to another community, one person to another person, one place to another place, through lips or verbally, orally. So oral literature is mostly African literature. African literature is mostly oral literature. Orator. And orator is very rich. The Africans used to receive their education through orator. They had storytellers in their communities. And those storytellers were Socratian figures. They used to tell stories to the young people, to the children. And through their stories, they used to teach the children and young people values, behavior, manners, etiquettes, customs. So orator was a source of education to the Africans. And if you explore African orator, you will find how rich they are are, the Africans are, in idioms, in proverbs, in myths. They have very uh, instructive myths. They have very significant proverbs, idioms. And all these wise words are very aphoristic statements, are the sources of education to the Africans. And Chinua Achebe, in Things Fall Apart, has accommodated many of the elements or ingredients of African origin. For example, he has used the meat, the meat of the tortoise, the meat of the iniki bard, and he has also used the uh, idioms and proverbs very frequently in, in the narrative of Things Fall Apart. Actually, in this way, Chino Achebe has Africanized English language. He is writing things fall apart in English language, which is not an African language. English language is one of the lingua francas of Africa today. So he's using this European language um, while writing about Africa. But very tactfully, he has Africanized this English. So how? by saturating it with local proverbs, myths, idioms, even uh, pigeons, words. He has pigeonized and creolized uh, English with an admixture of local language, local elements of local language. So in this way, orator has got a significant space in things fall apart. Okay. Now the last topic that I like to bring to your knowledge today 
eco-critical study of things fall apart. If you think of the name of the village of Okunko, the name of the village is Umofia. The meaning of Umofia is people of the forest. So just think of the meaning of this name. Umofia means the people of the forest. Forest is a mother figure to the Africans. You must not call them jungly from the word jungle. No. Jungle is a mother figure to the Africans. It provides them with food and shelter and protection. It prevents them from different arts of nature. It protects them from calamities of nature. So forest is the mother figure to the Africans. And if forest is destroyed, the existence of the Africans will be adjourned. And this is said by Chinua Achebe also. Chinua Achebe has uh, associated the Africans in close to the nature. Nature has got some disciplines. Nature has got some harmonies. And if these disciplines and harmonies are broken, there will be catastrophe, there will be calamity. And we find that Okunto, the protagonist of this novel, mm -hmm. suffers very terribly. So why? Because he has violated the rules, the norms, the harmony of nature. So ecology, we know that ecology, the all the things that are around us belong to ecology. And there is a system in this ecology uh, that we call ecosystem. And if ecosystem is broken, or if you tell upon the ecosystem, your existence will be charted. This is the idea. This is the uh, point that Chinua Achebe has brought to the knowledge of the readers that Africa can never be separated from uh, nature. Urbanization is essential, but if urbanization is done at the cost of the destruction of forests, that would bring disaster. And you will find lots of examples of this kind of attitude in many African writings. For example, in the Famished Road, the famous novel written by Ben Okri you will find the same thing, same attitude towards nature. The forests are destroyed, roads and streets are made, but life is now shattered into uh, anarchy, shattered into indiscipline. So if the forest goes, peace and harmony will go. This is African attitude towards nature. And if you think of this uh, particular aspect, and if you try to approach things fall apart, eco-critically, you will find how Chinua Achebe has very closely and intimately associated people with nature. And nature is a protector of the Africans. And if it is destroyed, if it is challenged, and if it is hazarded, man's life will be hazarded. This is the idea that has been incorporated into this text. So I think I have discussed some particular aspects of this text. And in my next class, I will tell you something about uh, different other aspects of this text and read a few chapters of this text. Okay. So uh, I like to stop here. Thank you very much.